Presider Omar Kajimeru sat at his desk and listened as the reports rolled in. And his cabinet advisors droned on about things that, while it was his job to care about, it was hard to listen to. Tax rates. Farm yields. Supply chain expansion into the areas of the South China Sea that still had so much radiation there that only machines could go in for the cleanup. Thankfully, a large number of elderly people who would not, by virtue of their age, live long enough to develop illnesses, were volunteering to assist the cleanup in the slightly less lethal areas. It kept the machine labor in the worst zones, and progress was being made. What I wouldn't give to have a population of humans, completely radiation-resistant. He thought privately. Then there were the scientific briefings. Those held more interest to the man, who still remembered being a science fair blue ribbon winner as a boy. We've avoided any systems where we've detected the signals, and the deep space probes still haven't found anything. Though a number have been destroyed by unknown causes. And the colony efforts? The presider asked. We have fixed long-term settlements in six systems, and we have plans for a dozen more. In addition, the cloning technology means we can expect at least one fully functional city-sized population within 30 years, even with a seed population of only 5,000 adults. We're also making use of this new element to lay the groundwork for colonizing the moon. It will take time, but in another hundred years, the city of Selene will be lighting up the night above us. The scientist was almost twitching in his seat. Good, but get back to those signals. Omar said and furrowed his brow. According to the briefing I received when I took office several years ago, you and your colleagues believed it was proof positive of alien life. It was on your recommendation that we built a fleet of warships. It was on your recommendation that we slowed down the ongoing reclamation of the wastelands. So, I have to ask you now, with the fleet almost ready to launch, with crews picked and ready. Why have you not made a mention of it since that day? The presider folded one hand over the other and laid them calmly on the desk. It was a sore point for a lot of legislators. And though he never acknowledged it outside of his cabinet meetings, it was a sore point for him too. The scientist, a man who, if anybody ever looked the part, was perfect for his role, with wild hair and white coat. The man even had old-fashioned pencils and an actual paper notebook in his pocket. He was Dr. Emmanuel Farnsworth, and he was widely regarded by most of the world as the smartest man on the planet, and by those who knew him best as the most eccentric. That's elementary, my dear presider. He said and brought out a pencil that he began tossing back and forth between his hands. The aged gnarled fingers were unusually dexterous. And between each toss, he flipped the pencil over and between each finger, before tossing it back again. You're probably wondering if we don't think it's alien life anymore, but no no. Nothing could be further from the truth ma boy. No, no, no. It absolutely is alien life. The rest of the cabinet, a dozen people in all beside himself, stiffened in their seats and turned their heads toward the old physicist. But it's not just alien life, it's aliens. He said, and the presider cocked his head. You're going to have to repeat that. He ordered the scientist. Well young man, it's aliens with a plural. We're picking up multiple different signals and what we believe are probably radically different digital languages and codes. We're not finding an oasis in the desert, we're finding island chains in the Pacific, and lots of them. The last probe to be destroyed, the one from just the other day, managed to catch an energy signature just before it was annihilated. It's not asteroids or rogue comets, or solar flares or any other anomaly. Someone blew it straight to hell. He tossed his pencil up in the air and caught it without looking at it. Dr. Farnsworth was a bundle full of energy, trapped in a body far older than the spirit it housed. So you're telling me there are multiple alien civilizations on our doorstep? Omar raised his eyebrows and leaned back in his chair, his hands spread out on the table, but they did not so much as tremble at the impossible news. Yes, that's it exactly. It's taken a few years of work, but we've managed to gauge the estimated power of the blasts that destroyed our probes, and we're dealing with a significant military presence. Emmanuel explained. But the Secretary of Agriculture raised an obvious objection. If that's so, why haven't they invaded? He asked. Why haven't they attacked? 
None of our colonies can properly defend themselves yet. And we have only one proper fleet. And who knows how much they have. Why not force us to surrender? He asked. And though he didn't openly acknowledge it, the presider couldn't help but agree with the sentiment. I have no idea. Emmanuel shrugged. Maybe some form of first contact restriction. Maybe they just don't need to invade. Maybe they don't see us as a threat. Maybe we don't have anything they want. Maybe they're naturally peaceful. Maybe they have some sort of cold war going, and we're located in just the right place to where nobody wants to make a move here, because of how the others will see it. Maybe they're just not interested in us. Maybe they're fighting some other war right now, and they're just warning us to stay away. We can't know why we're unwelcome, unless we go and say hello. And what if they're vastly stronger than us, and that prompts an invasion? Omar pointed out the obvious problem, and Dr. Farnsworth acknowledged it with a nod. True, but if we're going to go that route, we might never do anything. Based on what I've seen, it's obvious these species are able to communicate with each other. That means, they're probably not the sort to just start shooting. Now, as to why we didn't say anything. It's because until yesterday, we didn't actually have a translation. And now you do. Omar asked, and leaned forward halfway over his desk, his heart raced, and from what he saw of the rest of his cabinet, theirs were too. Disbelieving ears led to disbelieving faces. And Emmanuel drew out a small scientific data pad from inside his lab coat. Bear in mind, this is an approximate translation from their language to ours. The last probe we sent was transmitting number sequences based on the known constants of the universe and then creating translation codes from that to our language. They should have at least some grasp of our tongue by now. But as for us, we definitely have a grasp on theirs. He then pressed play. It was scratchy, closer to an old-timey record player than anything of the modern age, but it was there. Starship DX-42, authorization to destroy probe is granted. Record technological and transmission data for analysis by Blamia Science Authority and mark for highest priority. Patrol size increase for unknown border is granted. Six ships will join you within one cycle. Amazing. Omar gasped, the first alien voice on Earth, is there anything more? Oh no, nothing. Emmanuel chuckled and set his data pad back in his pocket, before he resumed fidgeting with his pencil. Just evidence of trade routes and regular passage, from a wide variety of energy signatures. We're part of a very big neighborhood, it turns out. And we didn't even know it. So what do you suggest, now that we do know it? Omar asked, struggling to clamp down on his sense of wonder in favor of focusing on the practical. Damn it, presider. I'm a scientist, not a general. Ask him. He tilted his head toward Admiral Wilhelm Tzu, and then snapped his pencil in half with one flex of his fingers. Right, Admiral. Omar asked. We send an equal number of ships to what they have in the area. Shields at maximum, weapons online, but not targeting. They should be smart enough to understand that this is where we say, you show us yours, we show you ours. Then to put it bluntly, presider, we hope nobody gets fucked. And if they decide, they're in the mood. Omar took the analogy a step farther, and Wilhelm dragged thumb and forefinger, from the center of his dark mustache, all the way to the tips above the corners of his mouth. Who can say? They may be thousands of years ahead of us. Or on par with us. Or behind us. But if our probes keep getting shot down, there's no way to know for sure. I'm afraid we really have no other option, but to either avoid contact and expand as far as we can first, thus letting them come to us. Which I don't care for as options go. Or we take the initiative and go to them. And if they destroy those ships like they destroyed those probes. The presider said and interlocked his fingers together, as if he was about to bring them up and start praying to the forgotten gods of man. Then close to 3,000 people die. But we'll know we've got an enemy out there. Maybe more than one. If that happens, we expand the fleet, we start ramping up colony development, and we do everything we can to make sure our technology is equal to or greater than everybody else's. 
and we hope to the stars nobody comes knocking before we're ready. The longer we wait and do nothing, the longer we have no idea what we're dealing with. Wilhelm answered, his face was grave, and silence hung about the room. Fine. But I want probes launched out in a wide area to make sure nothing else is incoming. Maybe around those trade routes. The presider said, and after a brief glance between the admiral and the scientist, which ended in a common nod, it was as good as done. One month later. Admiral James Madison Perry reclined in his seat, the display screen on his warship was split, showing the tactical positions of his ships on the bottom half, and a view of the endless void on the upper. Systems report. He asked, and a moment later the AI assistant replied. All systems green. Scan report. He called out. Twelve ships detected en route at half previously detected speed. His monitoring officer answered. Shields up. Slow our speed to match theirs. He gave the next order, then added. If they slow down further, slow down ours to match theirs again. Keep our heading on an intercept. If they don't stop, stop us just within weapons range. All hands to battle stations. In his many years of service, he'd imagined many scenarios in which he played the role of great hero, mighty explorer, even martyr to human survival. But in all of those scenarios, never did he truly dream of this kind of moment. You're really going to talk to aliens from another world. Fuck. I hope they don't treat us like they did our probes. He thought. It wasn't lost on him, but there was a very real possibility that this might kickstart a war if things went badly, a war that had no obvious outcome. He glanced away from the screen and toward his sensor monitor. I want constant scans of those ships as we come in. If hostilities break out, keep them going for as long as you can, and relay that information to Earth. But we, don't, run. Sweat was forming on the faces of most of the crew. He didn't blame them. It would have been on his too, if it weren't for a medical strength antiperspirant that he'd put on just before his shift began. One hour to intercept. 30 minutes to intercept. And we have visual. The monitoring station reported. On screen, maximum enhancement. He ordered, and there it was. They were definitely alien designs. They were long vessels, affixed with multiple gun turrets, and strangely enough, they were tri-segmented, almost like pitchfork heads that could shoot. Each segment was a third as long as the Terran fleet's largest ship. The red metal contrasted starkly with the blue and white of the Terrans, and a shimmering energy field was visible around the vessels. It could only mean that their own shields were not only up, but strong. Strong enough to be visible to the naked eye. The Red Fleet slowed down, and a moment later, so too did his own ships. The Red Fleet sped up by 10%, and his own matched them. His breath quickened, they'd begun a silent dance in the darkness of the void, each one slowing to match the other, and speeding up to do the same, drawing out, and compressing the time to first contact. Finally, his own fleet came to a halt. Hail them. Admiral Perry ordered, and a quick buzz told him, the order had been carried out. This is Admiral James Perry of the Starship Ericsson. Commander of the First Fleet, an official representative of the government of Earth and its colonies. I come in peace, and I mean you no harm. Eventually, the Red Fleet halted and arrayed their ships in a one-to-one -one position. So this is what a Mexican standoff is really like. I can't say I like it. Admiral Perry thought to himself and waited. There was no answer. We would like to talk. He added but there was no answer. They are hearing us, aren't they? He asked. Yes sir, but they're just, if they're transmitting, it's on a frequency we can't detect. The answer from comms did nothing to inspire confidence. Time ticked by, the transmission kept going. But the Red Fleet did nothing to return the attempt at communication. All right, if we have to dance, then I suppose I'll lead. He told himself after what felt like an eternity. Order the Starship Pacifica to take one weapon offline. Tactical stiffened for a moment, his entire body tensed. Do it. The Admiral snapped, and the command went out. 
keep the scam going, let's see what they do. Admiral Perry felt an almost preternatural calm come over him, as if he were making the most important decision of his life. Every breath moved slow as molasses down the trunk of a tree. Sir, one of their weapons has also gone offline. The monitoring station almost screamed it, and Admiral Perry felt his breath pick up its pace a little. Take another one offline. And every time they match the gesture, repeat it. If they take two offline, take down two of ours. James didn't have to repeat that order. One by one, then two by two, the fleets began lowering their weapons. The process went on, until there were no more weapons left to lower. Admiral, their capital ship has lowered its shields. Tactical reported, and Admiral Perry couldn't help but smile. All right now, son, it looks like it's your turn to lead. Let's get naked. He muttered and said, lower our shields. He commanded. As soon as the shields went down, a face appeared on the screen. At least they have mouths, but that's a lot of ears. How good can they hear? Are those ears? They look like the ones on my father's Doberman Pinscher. Weirdly cute though, weirdly cute. Why do I want to scratch his head? James wondered to himself, as he looked at the dark red and black furry alien, with the long snout and the piercing amber eyes. It spoke, and not for the first time in his life, Admiral Perry felt an overwhelming gratitude for the work of science. You are a bold one, Earth person. Lowering your weapons was a move full of risk. The alien said. Either they got lowered, or they got used. James answered and spread out his hands at his sides. And as I said, I come in peace. What should I call you, now that we're talking? James asked. You may call me. The alien answered. I'm afraid I can't make those sounds. Would you mind if I just loaned you one of our names, just for the purposes of address? James asked. His counterpart huffed and gave a nod. You may. You definitely look like a Rocky. James answered. Rocky. I like this name. The alien answered. I hoped you might. James replied with a smile on his face. Now, since we're not intent on killing each other, I came equipped with cultural and historical data on my species in the hopes of mutual exchange. So that we might learn about one another and the galaxy at large, now that we're venturing out into it. I see. Then, send your information. There are common knowledge resources I can provide in exchange. But I will arrange for the homeworld to compile a similar set of information and transmit that to your homeworld on our way home. That will be fine. Now, if we're not going to kill each other, then we should discuss borders and a long-term peace so we don't ever have to, wouldn't you agree? James answered. Before Rocky could answer, the monitoring station interjected. Sir, we're picking up a distress signal. James glanced at the monitor, then at the screen. Rocky seemed to pick up on the unspoken question and glanced at his own monitor. Words in the alien language were too indistinct to be translated, but Admiral Perry did not have to wait long. As Anti Cluster is raiding a shipping lane, just outside what is commonly accepted as your border, Rocky explained. They're a vicious species who despise all others. They will kill the crews and rob or seize the vessels. We have fought them many times. I see. And these are civilian ships. James asked. Almost certainly. Rocky replied. Then I suppose we have no choice but to render aid. Will you wait for us here? James asked. Rocky tilted his head to one side. If you wish. I suppose I can review your data while I wait for whatever is left of your fleet to return. Good man. James commended the alien. We'll be back in a jiff. Oh and by the way, what do you call your species? We are called Lamissa, James. Rocky answered. You intend to go and fight the Zenti for strangers. Truly. Aye. A civilian is a civilian, no matter what they are, and that means we've got a duty to do. See you soon, Rocky. My ships will be rearming once we come about, but they will be lowered when I return. James promised. Rocky looked away from the screen. Transmit to them the known configurations of Zenti cluster ships. That should give them an edge. 
Thank you Admiral Rocky. I think this might just be the dawn of a brand new era for us both. But first, we've got to go blow shit up. See you soon. Admiral Perry said and snapped off a quick salute. While the human vessels were gone, Rocky sat alone in his quarters, reviewing the information the human sent over. An hour had passed since the departure of the human, first fleet, and in that one hour of translated information, he completely lost himself. He did not find himself again until his first officer entered, and after smacking his fist against his chest, and startled Rocky out of his reverie. Sir. Is there something interesting there? Rocky didn't answer right away. How goes their fight? He asked. Lopsided. The first officer answered. Why, sir? This is why. Rocky replied and flipped his data pad around. There was a long category of wild and weird weapons moving over the screen. Every scrap of information I've reviewed here has suggested that we're dealing with an exceptionally predatory species. A true apex. We're lucky that we're still significantly more advanced than they are. Sir. His first officer asked as he watched the weapons change to pictures of armor and soldiers in uniform. Are they a threat? Everyone that isn't us is a threat. But a better question is, will they be of help? There's not enough predator species out there and we never know when things will start up again. If these are like us, we have a real chance at finding a way to help balance the scales just a little bit. Who knows? Perhaps the 99 terrors will become 100 in a few years. He huffed and wagged his tail. Before his first officer could speak again, Rocky interjected. Just make sure we arrange to get video footage of any hand-to-hand -hand actions in their fight against the Zenti. Maybe, just maybe, they'll show some fangs, and if I'm right, then so might Admiral Perry be. And a new day dawns with this one. The first officer was silent. Or maybe I'm wrong. Rocky acknowledged. Only time will tell. But we're through first contact now. And that's one small step for Glamias, one giant leap for Glamkind. Author's name and the link to original text is in the description. Consider tapping the thumbs up and pressing the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video.